Gerald Salente is the most accurate trend forecaster in the world. This interview is one of the best we've conducted, but Gerald's body of work goes back more than 30 years. Nothing could be more interesting than looking at how Mr. Salente has conducted himself in the past 10 years. In a special inclusion, we created the only report which goes back many years and gives the full picture of Salente's forecasts. Go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Salente right now where his history of accurate ideas is laid out in full. Welcome to the Leaders of Tomorrow show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming as a holiday season special, one of the most popular guests, a passionate and outspoken man who cares deeply about the people of this country. Going back 30 years, he has been forecasting incredible trends, which the mainstream media without fail finally catches up to about three years later. Today we are honored to be joined and welcoming back to the show, Mr. Gerald Salente. Gerald's track record is so uncanny that we have assembled the only online version of his Hall of Fame quotes and forecasts in one report that showcases his body of work. Everyone can go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Salente to download this exclusive free report. Gerald, happy holidays. Welcome back to the show. How are you today? Oh, very well, thank you. And thank you for the kind introduction. Oh, we are always honored to have you here. Our first question to you is this. Has President Trump's complex character and what might be behind his extensive Twitter account? For starters, Gerald, is Twitter sort of a modern day version of the weekly radio shows that some former presidents used to use to conduct and influence the population in one way or the other? And secondly, more importantly, during his first two years in office, the president has seemed to indicate that China is actually an enemy in some way to the United States and needs to be dealt with. China also happens to be a huge trading partner to the U.S. and one of its largest creditors. So is there much more than meets the eye to this it's sort of a chess match? So I guess our question to you is, who's winning, Gerald? Well, on the Twitter issue, it's, you know, it's the 21st century. It's their means of communication. It's a whole new world. It's not only Trump. You know, governments around the world are doing it. And it's just the latest form of propaganda. You could do it with, uh, what, you know, 200 and something characters, and, and you got what you have to say. So it's the perfect propaganda tool, so you don't have to give a lot of detail, and you can just put out a message. And again, governments all over the world are doing it. And it perfectly fits Trump's personality. You know, one of our trademarks is the presidential reality show. And, <laughs> that's true. And, and that's what it is. It's a reality show. And long before him, we, we, we coined that term actually in 2008 when Obama ran. Mm -hmm. and, on, and Oprah Winfrey took him under her arm and made him the perfect presidential reality show champion. He was down in the polls against Hillary Clinton before she came on scene. And I was on Oprah a couple of times. I've been on all the major media. And I mention that because nobody put on a show like her. She was truly, you know, the queen of the talk show circuit. So it's been a presidential reality show for a long time. And Trump is the presidential reality show champion. You know, he's the apprentice. It's perfect. And that's all it's become. Go to the debates. You know, what imbecile would call these things debates on, on the major networks? You have two minutes to answer a question and a 30-second rebuttal about, you know, foreign policy, about economics. So that's all it is, and Twitter fits into it perfectly. On the China issue, I'm a political atheist, by the way, and people that read the Trends Journal know that, and they know by our interviews, we call a spade a spade, issues are issues, not who you like, who you wish, or who you want. On the trade issue, go back to 1994. And America, under Bill Clinton, signs the NAFTA agreement. We've lost almost a million jobs, about 890-something thousand, since he signed us into NAFTA. We went from a basically an even 
a trade relationship to now we're at about a $71 billion negative with Mexico. Then take a look at China. Before China joined the World Trade Organization, and they came in, by the way, two weeks after 9-11, but it was really Bill Clinton again that brought China into the World Trade Organization. You look at their GDP and where they ranked globally. They were way down there. Today, China is the number two economy in the world. Within the next four years, they're estimated to have a GDP 80% the size of America's. Go back to when they came into the World Trade Organization in 2001. 5% of their population was middle class. Today, 35%. They have more middle class people than America has in total people in our nation, plus 100 million. When Trump and others complain about China stealing our technology, that's not true at all. What happened was the European companies and the American companies sold out the technology that we the people help pay for by getting their products made in basically a very low developing country at the time when you go back to the late 1990s, early 2000s and gave China all the technology that they needed. And the deal is this with the Chinese. You want to sell your product over here? You got to make it over here. Or else, as we see with the car tariffs, it's at 40%. Oh, and by the way, you have to become a partner with one of our state organizations. We'll call them private companies, you know, for the public, but most of them are state-operated enterprises, SOEs. But you can't own a majority share in it. You could only be a 49% owner in it. So what happened was that the Americans and the Europeans sold out our technology. Who would do business under the terms where you have a $375 billion yearly merchandise trade deficit? China cleaned up and America's gone down. So, I mean, those are just the numbers. So because there's such an anti-Trump movement in this country, the divided states of America, I have to tell you, if there was a Democrat in office trying to renegotiate the trade deals, you know, it would be a much more positive viewpoint and the Republicans would be coming out against it because they favor the multinationals and they're the only ones that benefited from this. Wow. Now, Gerald, shifting gears just a little bit, in our newsletter, we covered 2018's best performing cannabis millennials focused publicly traded company. The fact that this type of business, which we as a company will continue to focus upon for years, has been able to grow so rapidly is definitely a sign of the times. America's baby boomers generation has had a strong impact as a demographic for nearly 70 years, but now they're being eclipsed in size and influence by millennials. So what are the biggest trends and investment segments that are going to thrive over the next decade? Well, you mentioned, you know, the, uh, the marijuana, the pot legalization. You know, that was one of our major trends for 2016, reefer money madness. Yeah. This, this year, in 2019, the New Trends Journal will be going out in just next week. One of them is get high, get healthy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, and, of course, now with the new farm bill, hemp is going to be legalized as well. Let's go back to the end of Prohibition, 1933. That's where we are. But instead of alcohol, it's marijuana. And instead of just booze drinking it, now, as I said, you get high and you get healthy. You look at all the medical benefits of marijuana, and they're just trying, just now, starting to understand them. You know, one of the expressions that I use is if the planet could feed us, can it heal us? And of course it can. You don't need synthetic pharmaceutical drugs to do it. And for thousands of years, they've been using natural ailments. 
uh, natural herbs, excuse me, to cure ailments and other natural products. That's one element of it. Number two, very big again, I mentioned hemp in industrialization for apparel, for foods, for, for replacing plastics, for many industrial uses, you're going to see hemp. It's going to be a huge, huge, multi-billion dollar global business. Now, let's go to the bottom line. Why did they legalize an alcohol and end prohibition? They needed the money. It was the Great Depression. Tax dollars. We're going to tax the hell out of this product. People are going to buy it. And we, the politicians, could make some money doing it. And we could have our great jobs for doing nothing. Hire all our friends and other needless jobs. And the people will give us their money because they want to drink this stuff. So now you go on to marijuana. Why do you think these clowns, these little boys and girls of nothing, are the ones that criminalized it, are now all of a sudden legalizing it? They want the tax dollars. We got that little clown Cuomo over here in New York. Another guy born on third base and thought he had a home run. Him and his brother, Chris would be nowhere, no place. That's the fat mouth over there on CNN if daddy wasn't Mario Cuomo. He was so anti-marijuana. The moron, the little lowlife, and I would say this face-to-face to the clown, called it a gateway drug. That's his dumbest session saying that other jerk that just left his attorney general that if you smoke this stuff, you're going to become a heroin addict. Yeah. But hey, keep shooting those kids up, man, with all those drugs for, you know, they can't behave. They have attention deficit disorder. That's okay. But hey, don't smoke a joint. Anyway, they're doing it because they need the tax revenue. And that's why you're going to see it legalized in state after state after state and in country after country after country. It is by far the biggest trend we see in terms of growth, development, and new market opportunities. Fantastic for the farmers, for everyone, right? It's going to be huge. Oh, and by the way, think for one minute of all the lives that were ruined by other morons like Bill Clinton and all the others that passed those three strikes you're out legislation back in the 90s, if you got caught with marijuana more than three times, you're going to do life imprisonment. That's what kind of sick politicians are running a country, a state, and a city near you. Mm. Gerald, turning now to talk about France and the Yellow Vest riots that are taking place right now, is this an isolated event or does this indicate that a bigger problem exists within our society? I mention this because Connecticut-based billionaire and hedge fund manager Ray Dalio states that the wealth gap populism, and unfunded liabilities are the most immediate threat to the United States. Ray goes so far as to compare this period of time to the 1930s. You are a historian and a student of cycles and of the past. Are we actually cooking up a kind of toxic potion for ourselves? Yes, we've been writing about this for years. It's When you look at what's going on in France with the uh, the, the yellow vests, same thing now is happening in Brussels. It's happening all over. Look at the, in Italy with the five-star movement, Cinque Stella and Lega. Go to, go, to, go to Hungary with their policies as well as Poland, the AFD party in Germany, the alternative for Deutschland. Take a look at what's going on in Austria with the Freedom Party. The people are disgusted because the wealth has gone to the 1%. The, 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 what's going on in France is about that you read about it over and over again. The people can't make the ends meet. And you've got a little boy like Macron over there, the, the president, that, you know, a Rothschild boy worked for the bank. And what did he do? He gave a wealth tax. 
He made the wealthy people wealthier while they put more taxes on the people. The people can't make ends meet. What we're seeing are a number of things. In France, it's off with your head 2.0. And the other one is this is the beginning of the end as we forecast the Eurozone and the European Union. It's just starting to happen now. It's going to escalate. You take a look at America. We have three people, Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, and Bill Gates, have more money than half the United States population combined. Now take a look at the debt levels that the American consumer has. That's only over $13 trillion. Take a look at all these college students with on average of over $30,000 worth of debt. Take a look at the mortgage problems, on and on and on. Yes, it's a global revolution. It's an anti-establishment revolution, but at this time, it's not happening in the United States. Why do you think that is? Why do you think France is so willing to take to the streets and just riot crazy while the American people seem to be very docile? A number of reasons. You know, it's, um, I, I think it has a lot to do with, you know, what they eat, all the, all the pharmaceutical drugs that they take, and, and the brainwashing. Uh, you know, that you, I mean, here's a country where you've got no bullying zones. Hey, come on, I grew up in the Bronx, you know. I learned how to fight. I was a little kid. I was getting bullied all the time. I had to learn how to stand up for myself. Mm. And, and so it, when in America, you, you've, you've lost it. it, it, it we, we don't have that fight in, in that kind of sense. We don't have the individual integrity of ourselves not to take orders from morons. And so that's why you don't have it here. Look at the last election. You know, what was it? The fight between the two parties, which I call the Bloods and the Crips, because they're both murderers and thieves. Look at all the wars that they start based on lies, both parties, and look at all the money they steal from us in the names of Too Big to Fail and other wonderful deals to bail out banks, banksters, big corporations. It's, by the way, this isn't a failure of capitalism. As a paisano of mine, not very fond of, of course, Mussolini, he called it fascism, the merger of state and corporate powers. So you just saw an election, a midterm election, where the two groups are fighting and the people join each group. There's no new movement in this country. The people don't have the fight in them. And, they, and again, they're very easily brainwashed and they're filled with junk news. So, you, I mean, the whole thing going on with Trump since the day he got elected in 2016, every day, every day, it's an anti-Trump story. And again, I'm no fan of Trump, but I'm just saying it's a divided states of America and it's divided along party lines, not along principles. Right, exactly. That's the question I was asking because it doesn't seem like people of our country really stand up for their own individual principles. They sort of take sides from what they get from the media or their friends or whatnot. You know, um, shifting gears just a little bit and uh, just a note to our audience one more time, it's really impossible to um, interview Mr. Salente in a true platform that showcases his extensive knowledge. So we encourage everyone to take advantage of the free amazing report uh, indicates all of his amazingly shockingly accurate predictions over the past 30 years that are covered in this report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Salente. Now, Jim, Gerald, with the yield curve inversion that we are undergoing right now, and with the fact that even after three years and eight interest rate hikes, the Fed funds rate target is only at 2% to 2.25%, less than the level of CPI inflation. So what we have really is a Federal Reserve chairman who cannot win, because if he keeps hiking rates of the interest rates, he will slow the economy down altogether. But on the other hand, if he signals that rate hikes are over, it could cause a run on the dollar. So is the Fed stuck? 
It's not only the Fed that's stuck, they're all stuck. Again, all the, since the, the only thing that juiced the markets after the panic of 08 was the cheap money flows. Again, they didn't teach you zero and negative interest rate policies and quantitative easing in Economics 101 or graduate school. So let's take a trip to Japan. Take a look at their third quarter GDP. It was only down minus, what, 2.5? That's despite negative interest rates, negative bond yields. And how about, you know, how about buying a 10-year bond and in 10 years, we'll pay you back less money than you bought it for. So yes, the Fed is in a trap. The only thing that will keep the markets boosted in the United States are lower interest rates. And you see what happens when interest rates go up, the markets go down. Again, when you look at Trump's tax cuts, according to the Tax Policy Center, 1% got 82% of the benefits. The tax deal that he gave the corporations, where is it going? Stock buybacks. Hey, as a matter of fact, just this week, Lowe's announced they're buying $10 billion worth of stock buybacks. So the money didn't go into capital improvements because all you had to do is go back to 2005 and 2006 when George Bush did the same deal. It goes into stock buybacks. Back then it went into 96% of all the money repatriated overseas went into buybacks. And also in the United States, we're looking at a trillion dollars, according to the Goldman Sachs gang, of stock buybacks in 2018. So when the cheap money flow stops, the monetary methadone, that's when the economy is going down. And as you pointed out, so too will the dollar. However, what's Saving the dollar are the dire situations in all the other countries. Look at the yuan, the Chinese currency, seven-year low against the dollar. Look what's going on in China. Did you see their latest numbers coming out with uh, car sales? They're down 13% in November. They've been down several months in a row, the worst streak, losing streak since 1990. Housing market going down, luxury goods going down. Take a look at Europe. Just saw the numbers coming out of Germany, much weaker GDP than anticipated. Look at the emerging markets, look at their stock indexes. Many of them in bear territory down over 20%. Even the DAX 600. In Germany, down over 10%. The FTSE 100, down over 10%. So what's keeping the dollar afloat is that there's no competition. And that is going to be temporary, of course. And what's also keeping the dollar up, as long as oil is based in petrodollars, that's a big one too. Because again, looking at global currencies, they just had a big issue over there in India. Their GDP is much lower than anticipated, around 7.1%, which sounds good, but it's not good for them. Mm -hmm. And they just had their central bank head quit because the prime minister, no, Modi, wants to keep interest rates low and juice the economy with cheap money. And they did. They didn't raise interest rates last week, nor has Canada. They kept interest rates low last week as well. So what I'm saying is, take a country like India, like China, India having importing 80% of its energy, where do they buy that energy in? Petrodollars. Their rupees weighed down, it's going to cost them a lot more. Same thing with China. They're the biggest importers of energy. The yuan is going down, costs them more to buy the oil and other energy products. Wow. Gerald, what do you think that the next election cycle will be about predominantly? And from your vantage point, do you believe that the next president will be forced to cut Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid? I don't think they'll do that. Uh, 
what will the next election be about as senseless as the one that we just went through now? <laughs> Identity politics. Look, you look, look at, look at the, you talk about cutting Medicare and social security. Hey, don't send the CIA after me, the FBI or NSA. How about cutting the damn defense budget? It's going to be $750 billion, according to Trump, in 2020. What are you doing with all this money? Build an obsolete, antiquated garbage that enriches the military-industrial complex that President Dwight D. Eisenhower, five-star general, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in World War II, and two-term president warned the American people of in his farewell address in January 1961. How about cutting that back? How about ending these wars that America hasn't won a war since World War II? The longest war in American history in Afghanistan, still going on, no end in sight. Not one word of war was mentioned in the entire midterm elections by the so-called politicians that ran for office. So if you want to cut something and build the economy, think about that one, because one of my sayings is, we're talking about China before, and you see how they have developed since they've got into the World Trade Organization. The business of China is business. They're buying up the world. They got their new yellow silk road. They're investing worldwide. The business of China is business. The business of America is war. Wow. That's pretty tragic, isn't it? It is. Because the tragedy is you're murdering, well, go back to the, uh, the lie that George W. Bush got us into the Iraq war. Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction and ties to Al-Qaeda. And again, myself and many others knew it was a lie, wrote about it, details were there. And what has happened since the war on terror began? Six trillion dollars spent of our money. Could you imagine six trillion dollars going into the economy to build the third world infrastructure that we have now? You've been on the trains in New York City? It's a night in Calcutta. Yeah, let's use that money to also kill over a million people, destroy nations throughout the Middle East, and along with him, the Nobel Peace of Crap Prize winner, Barack Obama. We got to get rid of that uh, Gaddafi, I tell you, because I don't like the way he's treating his people. Oh, yeah, the richest country in Africa. You think the United States would have invaded Iraq and destroyed Libya and got in there if their major export was broccoli and not oil. So it's going on. By the way, that's why you have this migrant and refugee crisis in Europe. And you know, we wrote about this for years. Gaddafi, before he was killed, matter of fact, it's in our latest Trends Journalist quote. He warned Europe, if you get rid of me, you're going to have a migrant crisis flooding out of Libya south through Africa into Europe, and you won't be able to stop it. He stopped it when he was there. He had made a deal that no migrants would go through Libya into Europe. When he was killed, within two months, over 500,000 refugees flooded into Europe. But nobody talks about the wars that are bringing refugees into Europe. And by the way, one of our top trends for 2019 is human waves. It's not only refugees, it's countries all around the world with corrupt governments, with high levels of violence, and no jobs and no future. It's all in the numbers. If you go back 100 years ago, there were 1.6 billion people on the planet. In 100 years, we added another 6 billion. 6 billion in 100 years there's not enough jobs, not enough employment. You're going to see a refugee and migrant crisis that's going to continue and continue with no end in sight. 
Gerald, shifting gears just a little bit, should the average person invest in America's top 500 companies via the S&P 500 for the long term? In other words, are America's problems limited to just its currency, its government, and its lower income segments, while corporate America seems to continue to shock the world with very dependable double-digit growth and expansion into emerging markets and into China. For example, we're seeing Starbucks, which most people probably believe has only branches here in the United States. They're opening up a new branch in China every 15 hours. What is your perspective on this? Well, you have winners and losers there. You have a lot of entrepreneurs that haven't done well, as well as a number of companies there. So yes, there's always going to be opportunities. On, on giving advice, we, we're, we're not permitted to give financial advice. So I can't talk about what to invest in and what not to invest in and where the markets are going to go in that direction. And that's not my, my forte as well. As a matter of fact, one of them is gold. And on the gold issue, for the better part of the year, I've been saying that the bottom of gold, and I'm not giving advice to, to invest, is $1,200. It hit 1185 That was the lowest it hit. As we're speaking, it's around 1250 And we're saying that gold has to go to $1,450 an ounce and stay there for a bit. If it does, we're forecasting it'll spike to $2,000 an ounce and above because we see a global debt bomb that's ready to explode. There's over $250 trillion worth of global debt. Much of it is dollar-based. If the dollar stays strong and other currencies get weak, there's going to be a big difficulty with all these countries paying off their debt, and a lot of it's coming due. We also heard the Fed chair, former Fed chair, Janet Yellen, just a few days ago, come out and warn about the corporate debt. It's a real issue. So on the, on the stock issue, we're not so sure that we, we think the, we, 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 well, we're saying the bear, the, uh, the Trump rally, it's over. You know, we may see another little spike here and there, but by and large, it, the, it, the downward potential is much greater than the upside. And again, these are only, these are all cyclical moves. One of the things, the mistakes I've made in my life is that when I saw a panic come, I thought it would keep going. I didn't realize that they would come up with new scams to change the direction with ideas and concepts we never heard of before. As I said, zero negative interest rate policies and quantitative easing. So uh, as far as investing in the, con in the country, in the S&P, I, I don't know. But as far as investing in other countries, of course. And multinationalism is the game. And, but there's going to be a big pullback against it. And you're going to see more and more populism, nationalism movements. Matter of fact, one of China's goals in the coming years is a self-sustaining economy. Because 80% of China's GDP, consumer-based. Bigger than the United States, we're at about two-thirds to 70%. So if you have those consumers buying all those products, you want them made in China. That's very interesting. So they won't have to go outside the country for imports. Um, it's a very interesting concept. As, less, as few as they can get, that's what they want. And by the way, that was one of our top trends back in 2016, mm. self-sustaining economies. The United States could be a self-sustaining economy. I mean, if you want to get in some nice French wine or Italian prosciutto, you know, knock yourself out. Right. But at one time... You know, we used to make our own clothing. If you wanted to buy, of course, a high-end piece of garment from France or Italy, you could do that. But now, nine, over 90% of all our clothing is imported. So all those mills and all those factories that used to employ people with middle-class jobs are gone. So China sees that, and what they want to do is to have a self-sustaining economy by manufacturing at home. And the same could happen in any country that has the human and natural resources, and America certainly has them. 
Of course we do. It's so sad to know that we lost that. And it was not so long ago that we had all of that. Maybe what, 80 years ago, something to No, that? no. The big, the big clothing uh, one happened in the 1990s oh. under the Clinton administration. Oh, yeah. That's when, that's when the real shock happened with, with both NAFTA and China joining the World Trade Organization. You know, it was slowly moving offshore, but because of the laws in place, the tariffs and, and the other issues, it would cost you more to import it than it was worth to get it made cheaply. Hmm. So what would you think it would take? How long for us to go back to something like that? And do you foresee that? Because that would be highly beneficial to the people of this country. Well, I, I don't see it with the political system we have. You know, I tell people, Google up the definition of politician. Just Google it up. They'll say, you know, someone that runs a political office, blah, 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 blah. And the next part is a person that is typically manipulative and devious to gain advancement within an organization. That's a politician. And by the way, I've met them, a lot of them. There's a photograph of me over there with Ronald Reagan. I used to be a chief government affairs specialist for the chemical industry. We hired him to speak to our group two days before he ran against Jerry Ford back in 1976. I was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate. Designed and instructed American politics and campaign technology at St. John's University. I know what the system looks like. I've been with princes, prime ministers, and presidents. And there's a thing in America that they call campaign contributions. How about bribes and payoffs? So what I'm saying, you're not going to see a self-sustaining economy as long as we have a political system the way we have it now and the politicians are nothing more than political whores that get paid to put out by their people that give them the money to put out. So we need a new system. And one of the systems that we're recommending in an age of blockchain is blockchain democracy. Do away with the political system and let people vote on the major issues. Oh, it can't be done, people will say. Well, they're doing it over there in, in Switzerland. and what, the 11th richest country in the world, haven't been in a war since 1850, they have direct democracy. The people vote on the major issues. You don't know who the president of Switzerland is. Mm. So what I'm saying is, even on voting, look at the moronic system we have in this country. Look at the voting breakdowns in the midterm elections. You could have blockchain voting. If you could transfer trillions of dollars in a millisecond and it's blocked, you can't hack into it, can't you vote like that? So that's again, blockchain. That's, that's amazing, Gerald. I, I think that's an absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So blockchain, matter of fact, that was a feature story in our November Trends Journal. Now, let's go back to blockchain democracy. People say, well, no, oh, they could do it in Switzerland, but, you know, we're a bigger country. It doesn't make any difference. You know, again, with blockchain voting, you know, it doesn't matter how many people are voting, it happens quickly. And number two, people will say, well, the people are too stupid. And, you know, they don't know what's going on. You're going to put the future in their hands? Oh, no. I'd rather keep it in the hands of uh, Nancy out of a mind Pelosi or Diane not so Feinstein or little Chucky Schumer or uh, Mitch McConnell. Now, there's a brilliant cat. How about uh, Paulie Ryan? Oh, He's not going to be there next year, right? He's going to go back to play Eddie Munster again? I mean, come on. Look at these politicians. You got to need them to think for you? So what we're saying is the only way this is going to happen, go back to how the conversation began. Look what's going on in France. The people have had it with the establishment. They want the power in their own hands, not those in the hands of the privileged princes and prince. Now, Gerald, lastly, are you foreseeing another 2008-like scenario? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. the, again, just read and listen. Mm -hmm. You're hearing the IMF come out warning. I just mentioned Janet Yellen warning. The OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, sending out warnings. The World Bank. You mentioned Ray Dalio 
He's been warning about it as well. So have Paul Tudor Jones and others. The markets were overvalued and over leveraged. They're pumped up with cheap money. Again, you're looking at a trillion dollars worth of stock buybacks. And again, just this week, you saw Lowe's buy back $10 billion in stocks, merger and acquisition activity, corporate loans, student and public debt. We have a debt bubble that's ready to explode. The only thing that's stopping it from happening is more monetary methadone, but at some point, that bull ODs. <laughs> wow. Gerald, it is always amazing to have you on this show. How can everyone follow your work? Just go to, uh, well, we're of course, Facebook, Gerald Salenti, and our YouTube, Gerald Salenti, and Twitter. But, of course, the big one is the Trends Journal, the only magazine where you'll read history before it happens. It's a monthly trend alerts each week, and we do trends in the news broadcasts every Monday through Thursday. Money back guarantee, history before it happens. Absolutely brilliant. Gerald, thank you so much for being on the show today. And thank you, and thank you for all that you do. Mr. Gerald Salente, the genius behind TrendsResearch.com and whose famous quotes and uncanny predictions are showcased in our exclusive report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Salente. For the leaders of tomorrow's show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. Check out trending interviews right now. Harry Dent, the famous deflationist who predicts single-digit silver and has now changed his tune. Greg Manorino with a no-holds-barred interview where he lays out his top ideas. Trace Mayer goes ballistic on crypto doubters. Jeffrey Tucker explains the details of crypto. Portfolio Wealth Global has published the only report online that deals with exactly how to thrive through bear markets in gold and crypto. Go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash bear now. Thank you.